All right. Uh, in this last section, I would like to reflect mostly on a passage in the letter to the Hebrews. The letter to the Hebrews is a very daring gift from God to us. Um, but it so accents the reality of the humanity and the way our Lord Jesus entered into our humanity. You know, back in um, chapter 2, uh, verse 14, um, uh, because the children, he's just been talking about the children of Isaiah, share blood and flesh, so he absolutely in the same way shared with them that through death he might render powerless the one who has power over death, that is the devil. And having reconciled everybody, uh, or freed everybody, uh, who were held captive by the fear of death. We don't have to be afraid of death. This is what, oh, see, death is a diminution. So we're afraid of every diminution. Somebody cuts me off in traffic, that's a diminution. I get furious because I'm a nut. You know, uh, it's a little tiny death. The thing we fear more than anything else is diminution. Uh, not to have enough money. Uh, to have somebody make fun of us. Uh, whatever. And you see, that's the fear of death. And because of that fear of death, the devil can keep the world in, in uh, captivity. Keep the world in slavery. Uh, you know, suppose some guy in a business and he knows the boss is cheating uh, and that it's bad. But if he mentions it, he'll get fired. Fear of death. Keeps him cooperating in a sin because of the fear of death. That Satan has him captured, trapped, enslaved. Okay, so that's what we're talking about now. In this beautiful text, um, which is chapter 4, verse 15, down to chapter 5, verse 10. Um, okay. Uh, having a high, great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession of faith. All of that image comes from the Feast of Yom Kippur when the high priest goes through the veil into the Holy of Holies. Jesus goes through there, pierces the veil, his flesh, as Hebrew says, and he goes in there and breaks and finds, effects an eternal redemption. Okay. For we do not have a high priest unable to know by experience our weakness. You see, um, sympathise, suffer with us, you see, having been tempted in all ways, in keeping with the likeness without sin. Uh, I have to explain that a bit. That's a very literal, it's mine, it's a very literal translation, you see. Um, that, um, you see, we have a high priest able, having, having been tempted, karapanta, according to the likeness, that is, uh, the likeness to us. The omimata, the omioma, the likeness to us. In that regard, you see, he was tempted in everything, just like us. He has a, a body like us. Uh, he has fears like us. He even said to the Father, if there's any way out of this, that the, you know, he's lived with us. And so, you see, but no sin. But that's how much he knows us from the inside. You see? This is to begin the resurrected life, is to know his power, his compassion. And that's the word that's used here, right? Uh, that he would have sympathia. Sympathia comes from two Greek words, sim with, path, suffer. Suffer with. Not just I feel for you, you know, but suffer with. Okay. Let us approach then with assurance the throne of grace 
that we might find mercy and receive mercy and find grace at the right time of need. We can go there because he's passed through the veil, but he was on this earth. And now, in this is the theology of the agony in the garden as uh, developed and portrayed by the letter to the Hebrews. For every high priest uh, taken from among men is constituted for the sake of men regarding the things that pertain to God that he might offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to be moderate with the ignorant and the erring, since he himself is beset with weakness. And for that reason he must, as for the people, so for himself, make offering for sin. And no one takes the honor upon himself, but rather is called by God, just as Aaron was. Now the text is going to take that description of the high priest liturgy and apply it to Jesus' liturgy, which is the cross. And so also Christ. He did not glorify himself to become high priest. Rather, the one who declared to him, You are my son, this day I have begotten you. That's from Psalm 2, right? As he says in another place, You are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek, You're always a priest Jesus exercises his priesthood from heaven. That's where he is made priest. You see? Uh, Now, how did he get there? You're going to have that text, uh, which is there in chapter, in verse 6, you see? And then uh, the uh, last line of this section. In other words, how is he a priest according to the order of Melchizedek? That's the question. This is the answer who in the days of his flesh, having offered prayers and entreaties, he suffered. To him who could save him from death, with a strong cry and tears. So he's frightened. And he's offering prayers and entreaties to him who could save him from death. Now, save him. Who's the him from death? Himself but also us, because we're joined to him. Save him from death. You see? Uh, This is to live the resurrection, what's going to be said here. You see? This is how he lives the resurrection for all eternity. Um, With a strong try and having been heard because of his reverent submission. That's beautiful, isn't it? Not what I will, but what you will. This is the agony in the garden, seen from this perspective of the this huge mystic, this letter to the Hebrews man, author. You see, uh, he's offering himself. And this is his priestly offering, you see. And he's offering it not as the uh, the priest offers, you see, gifts and sacrifices. He offers prayers and entreaties and tears. That's his liturgy. Do you see what I'm saying? How important this is? Because it's, it's going to go on now. Could save him, himself, and him, him, meaning us. Everyone joined to him is him. You see? Save him from death with a strong cry and tears and having been heard because of his reverent submission. Isn't that beautiful? You see? Uh, his reverent submission. You see? Uh, uh, his isarkothis, he was heard because of his evlavis. And then, though being son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. He learned obedience. He experienced now this is a this is a classic um, expression in Greek. It builds on the two words, pathin and mathin, to suffer and to learn. We get mathematics from the first word, uh, and we get passion and words like that from the first one. So, you see, it says. Um, 
Keper on Hios, being son, he's the son of God. Emathen afon epathen teen hipakoin. He learned. The son of God learned. He, he acquired what he never had before. Pain in his flesh, fear in his emotions. He learned it. And he learned it from what he suffered. You see? And now having been made per- perfect, there's an allusion to ordination there, which I don't have time, I don't think, to go into right now. Um, he became, for all who obey him, the source of an eternal salvation. How? Because of this, you see, he's still fixed in the act of love in which he died. He learned obedience. He acquired in his humanity something he didn't know before in the same way. The depth of this obedience right through to death. Not what I will, but what you will. You see? And then, having agreed, he learned what that obedience costs the crucifixion. And because of that, you see, then he was made perfect. Um, as I said, having been made perfect, uh, it's an expression. In the Hebrew text, sometimes the ordination rite is to pliron taskiras, uh, to fill the hands. That doesn't make any sense in Greek. It's, it's a, a Hebrew phrase, meaning giving them something to offer. So they, the translators changed it to, to tell you and to make perfect. So having been ordained, having been made perfect, you see, uh, he has become the source of salvation and eternal salvation. Uh, and it goes on to say the same idea again about Melchizedek. Having been proclaimed by God, high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, so you see, it's not over. You see, uh, this is a wonderful line. It's from a book by... Um, uh, uh, Father Duwell, Francois Xavier Duwell, who's dead now. Uh, and uh, he says, Thus Christ exalts the person of the Apostle and magnifies him in proportion as he demands that the Apostle die to himself. For it is in the Apostle's own person that the salvation of others is worked out. I rejoice in my sufferings. You see, for you. It's in the apostle's own person that the salvation is worked out. This is living the risen life now. The prime law of the apostolate then is a law of communion in Christ and in his mystery of redemption. Everything else, the law of incarnation, for instance, or external activity is secondary, though not subordinate. It can only follow from this first law. So that living the resurrected life means sharing in the dying of Christ so that we can live his rising and his life. Sure of ourselves. No matter how bad it gets, sure of ourselves. Why? Because he's passed through death. He is alive, risen, glorious, still marked with the signs of his passage among us, you see? And now we pass the same way. You see, the mystery of redemption is both death and and rising. And we have to live death and rising in the risen Christ. That's what we celebrate at Easter. The glorious, eternal mystery, beauty, power, light of the risen Christ living his passion and resurrection in us.